This is The Strange Recital, a podcast about fiction which questions the nature of reality. <laughs> Chopped into triangles by the superstructure of the bridge, the sun strobed as he accelerated across the span. On and off the sun flashed. The sunlight splintered and exploded. The sharp steel cut the sun like a sickle. Something in his mind snapped the pavement a field of fallen sun. He drove over the harvest. He closed his eyes. The light played upon his lids like a film leader. There was a countdown. The numeral five appeared in the center of a circle. A line swept around like a second hand, the circle graying behind the brush. As the radius line reached the 12 o'clock position, the numeral four appeared, and the second hand swept again. Three. The second hand swept again. Two. One, the Hudson flowed below. He glanced up at the road. Maybe you should drive for a little while, baby. She was a good driver. He could recognize a good driver immediately. The first time he had seen her slide behind the wheel and insert the key, he knew. She had performed a silent pre-flight check, located every switch and dial, and adjusted the mirrors. On the road, she understood that it was all about anticipating, being aware of how things were unfolding, Seeing the highway, not running out of fuel or overheating. Knowing that Chrysler up ahead was going to cut across three lanes and exit at the last possible moment. He was having these thoughts with his eyes tightly shut, traveling twice the legal limit. He took a quick peek at the road. The strobing was worse than ever. His pupils were wildly dilated. His car bouncing over a fresh crop of sun, dropped there by the steel scythe. Another countdown. Four, three, two, one. We have ignition, liftoff. A triangular window in the lunar module, throwing a sliver of sun onto the astronaut's spacesuit, touching down in a sea of tranquility. Wake up, she was screaming, steering with her left, hitting him with her right, eyes on the road. Slow down a little, she said. Maybe she could steer and he could work the pedals. He eased off a bit and the strobing slowed, this frequency setting him off. They were less than a third of the way across the bridge. There was no stopping. Set cruise control, she said, as she pressed the buttons in the correct sequence. Relax, it's clear sailing. He wasn't so sure. The strobing was relentless. I've seen how this goes, and this is not how it ends, she said. Presumably, she did know how it ended. This girl practiced clairvoyance. Is there an M, she would ask, sitting at a little round table. East Village C or 2nd Avenue storefront, crystal ball ready. Is there an M? Mama, mumbles the mark. Where's your mother? For you to be truly free, you must bring to me her diamond brooch. Money is not important. Your well-being is at stake. Her sister also had the gift. Her uncle ran the show. The strobing flickered like a movie. There was a title card that appeared to be in Romani. She learned to drive, taking twice weekly trips to Philadelphia with her uncle. At 13, she would ride along with him for some kind of delivery or pickup. Outside the warehouse, waiting for him to reappear, she would sit behind the wheel, pretending to drive. She located switches for lights, wipers, turn signals, and high beams. She practiced pressing the pedals. There were rolls of fifties and hundreds held by broccoli rubber bands in a gypsy trunk. She never asked any questions, a condition for riding along, but even as a kid, she knew the storefront operation didn't generate that kind of cash. One day, her uncle emerged from the meeting not right. You must drive, he said. She was 14. The Jersey Turnpike was a terrifying thrill. Every driver aggressive all the time. The bench seat pulled closer, uncle's knees at his chin his head loose on the spine. There was change for the toll booth mixed up with spent cigarettes in the ashtray, a hook shot into the basket as she had seen him do. She started to drive the route regularly, her uncle giving her pointers and navigating on the way down to Philly, out of it and no help on the way back to New York. When she was 15, her uncle died in the car, a bullet in his chest. Her high-speed chase to the hospital Pennsylvania state troopers in pursuit made the national news. The film reel ran out and unspooled. They were two-thirds of the way across the bridge. The strobing continued, 
The sun fell like golden wheat. Hey, baby, he said, his eyes tightly closed. Yes, she said, calmly steering from the passenger seat. When you see the future, he continued, what does it look like? I mean, do you watch a little stage play inside the crystal ball? Do you hear voices? Every person who steps into shop knows future already, she said. It is only for me to help them to see it. When I came to you that day, and you read my fortune, did you know we would become lovers? Of course, she said. The cards told me so. Also, I thought you were rich. Turns out I was wrong about that, but you are a gentle soul. And you have car in Manhattan. And what about your uncle? Couldn't you see that coming? Could you affect the future? He knew that he would meet a violent end, she answered. When you live a life such as his, it is only a matter of time. He chose not to concern himself with any of those thoughts. Also, I took rolls of money. I was a child. There was so much, I thought no one would notice. In, how you say, in retrospect, I may have hastened his demise. I can see future, but timing is most difficult to discern. What about the end? You said you've seen how this ends. The end for you, she said. You know that it will be peaceful. You will slip away in your sleep, and I will be by your side. He went into a dream about sleeping and grinding wheat, his snoring the sound of millstones. She studied the lines on his palms. She conjured a little stage play and heard voices. She failed to see the brake lights up ahead. The chaff scattered on the breeze and fell into the river below. That was Gypsy Soul, written and read by John Montgomery, Esquire. John, welcome to The Strange Recital. Thanks. I... Yes, it's always a pleasure to have a writer here for the first time. Whoa, wait a minute. I have been here before. I don't think so. Tom? Nope. I was just saying to myself in the elevator. Elevator? I was thinking how nice it was to be heading up to the 51st floor of the Time Warner building, up to the offices of The Strange Recital, overlooking Central Park. Mm-hmm. The view, look at the twinkling lights of the city through this grand window. Those lights are on the mixing board in the control room. Wait, what? No matter, we're here to discuss your story, Gypsy Soul. Yes, I remember that one. I certainly hope you do. All of the questions that writers feel at readings boil down to one question, really. Mm. And we'll start with that one. What was your inspiration for this story? The coal yard opened at eight. The rising sun barely tickling the buildings on the west side of First Avenue. I put some money down on the bar. Hmm. The cash looked like foreign currency to me. I didn't recognize it, though. I had thrown it down there near every morning. I remember staring at the unfamiliar bills. Perhaps you were at the international bar. Don't think that I hadn't thought of that. This was troubling. Nothing seemed familiar. Wait. I'd most certainly experienced deja vu, but this seemed to be the opposite. Jamais vu. Yeah, maybe. Hang on. Deja vu, I understand. Many mornings there was the same exchange, the same banter and repartee, the same stories told with the same corrections and objections, but they occurred in a different order or didn't recur for weeks. A confabulation of memory. I turned the cash over on the bar and examined it. All of the bills were the same size with different numbers in the corners. How would a blind man know what each note was worth? Exactly. Everything seemed strange and new and not in a good way. There was a time when I had walked different streets each day to shake up the familiar. I would see a new restaurant or shop or, better yet, a new pub. The city living and changing, but the familiar won out, but, and the coal yard opened at eight. But how did all of this shape this particular story? I left the bar, 
when the small pile of cash was exhausted. I stood before the door of my building and looked down at the keys in my hand, more foreign objects. Mm. One of these keys on the ring would unlock the door. I hadn't forgotten everything. Maybe we could get to the key to your story. I considered how the lock set worked, the sawtooth pushing the tumbler pins into the springs or something like that. The locksmith told me to use only graphite to lubricate the chamber. A-A-A-A-A locksmith. First in the phone book, yeah. Driving is an important part of your story. There was a car key on the ring, though. I don't own a car. Well, at least I don't think so. I singled out the key and held it in a car starting position. Hmm. The ignition switch clicked and I cranked the motor to life. There were vivid sounds of cars passing and horn honking. Yes, your story begins with driving. Crossing a bridge which... I looked up to find that I was standing in the crosswalk in the middle of First Avenue. Cars were passing in front of me and behind me. My keychain held out at arm's length. I drew the keys back toward my body but made no movement toward the sidewalk. The keychain itself was now of interest. Traffic was swerving and honking. There was the shaking of fists and cursing. Can we? It wasn't a janitor's set, but there were a fair number of keys on the ring. Mm. Three rings, actually. A circus of keys. Two rings full of keys linked to a third that had a tourist shop trinket attached. Yeah, it's hard to watch all three rings at once. There was a tiny photograph of the Golden Gate Bridge under a glob of clear epoxy on one side and San Francisco, California printed on the other. But the characters in your story were on a bridge crossing the Hudson. It appeared that the keychain could be used as a bottle opener as well. <sighs> I looked up and was struck by the mirror of a passing cube truck. I went to the avenue in a pool of blood. Um, John. The sound of sirens in the city is not uncommon, but... John. Lying in the street, knowing that approaching ambulance is heading for you is a new angle. Speaking of new angles, mm -hmm. maybe we could approach the discussion of your story in a different way. Lying on a gurney in the hallway at Bellevue... This isn't working. I mm. stared at the ceiling. To my left, a man in an orange jumpsuit and shackles was bleeding profusely from a gash in his forehead. Two uniformed officers behind him seemed unconcerned that their prisoner was tasting his own blood as it ran down his face. Probably on his way to Rikers. Yeah. Where you may be bound as well. They put a dozen staples in my head, spun me around three times, and pushed me back out into the avenue. It was 11 o'clock in the morning. It had been a full day already. Yes. It has. I stood before the door of my building and looked down at the keys in my hand. It's like deja vu. Yep. My personal effects in a plastic bag by my side. I inserted the key for the outer door of the building, checked the mail with a smaller, simpler key, yeah. and unlocked the inner door. I climbed the four flights to my apartment and used different keys to get through that door. Right. I lay down on the floor and slept without a dream or thought. <laughs> the coal yard opened at eight. Shouldn't they have held you overnight for observation or something? I stumbled out onto the street and bought a bacon, egg, and cheese on a roll at a bodega on 2nd Avenue. I ate standing up, leaning over the bag. I think you need some help. Some guidance. Down the avenue, the loveliest girl was setting up a sandwich board sign on the sidewalk. She was slim and dark, advertising psychic services. I hoped that she would accept foreign currency. My head was pounding as I followed her into the shop. She slipped through a beaded curtain into the back room. Mm. In the front where I stood was nothing fancy. Little round table, Second Avenue storefront, crystal ball ready. The air smelled of jasmine, eucalyptus, sweat, and cat piss. Uh -huh. She emerged from the back and jumped slightly when she saw me. I knew you would come, she said. Sit down. I started chatting nervously like I was on a first date. I spoke knowingly about subjects I knew nothing about. I went on about baking bread. The sun streamed into the shop like golden wheat. I imagined us as lovers. There was grinding. Oh. She peered into the crystal ball and saw a grist mill and water wheel, and she struggled to explain. I see a river, she said. Wait, wait. Maybe. Brent, what should we do about this? I think we need to pull the plug. Yeah, we should shut this down. I'll ring for the elevator. So, John, we have to be out of these offices at midnight. I'll start packing up. Chopped into triangles by the superstructure of the I think I might grid, play some of that music we heard. As he
This is The Strange Recital, on the web at thestrangerecital.com. The music on this episode was Fauna and Fell by Patrick Kilpatrick. This is episode 21071. I hear thunder. <laughs> 